So we're recording some of this field stuff to get up on the website. So if you're interested or need to send you know, your friends or colleagues to see what we're doing today, it'll be up on our website. So what you're looking at here is obviously a palm tree that doesn't look so good. And we're pretty sure, at least I am, I'm, I'm pretty confident that this one has probably died from South American palm weevil attack. You see it's got the classic symptoms, the crown has gone. It's just a ring of green leaves at the top of the trunk. Those will eventually turn brown over time and you'll end up with that halo or just that ring of leaves left at the top of the trunk. There's a smaller palm tree at the back which has probably also collapsed because of palm weevil attack. But as you probably notice, what's kind of curious is that we have a lot of healthy looking palms in close proximity to us which appear to be just fine. We don't really understand how these weevils decide which palms are going to be attacked and why we end up with like hot spots, spotty, you know, heavy infestations where, you know, two, three, maybe four palms die. And then a whole bunch of them look fairly good nearby and they may stay that way for a, quite a period of time. I mean, you know, many hundreds of feet away, you might see another pocket of palms going down. So the, the way the weevil spreads, it's not really, I don't think very well understood. But I think the other thing I'd like you to take away from visiting here that there are a lot of naturalized Canary Island palms in here obviously they haven't been planted deliberately the seeds have just dropped the, the water tables not that be far below our feet so it's easy for them to get their roots into a lot of water you push whack your way through you know, this direction you can actually come to basically large ponds of freestanding water where the water table is so close to the soil surface it's actually standing there you know it's some people have scooped out holes where it might be at least five deep for freestanding water so it's not a big deal for these palms to get their roots down to the water where they need to be and that's another misconception I think with palms as Don was pointing out this morning is that they do actually need quite a bit of water and that's why they do well in riparian areas or oases where they can get their roots down and there's a saying in the Middle East that these palms lift their feet in the water and the sun and their heads in the sun and it's blistering hot in say Saudi Arabia or Pakistan where they grow these palms uh, uh, what was else I was going to say? Right, uh, the other thing is that, that makes it hard to do work in this area, and that's why we want the drone, is that it's very hard, almost impossible in some instances, to bushwhack your way through all of this brush to get to these individual palms to figure out whether or not they're dying. If we could fly the drone over the tops of these palms and map them all and do that every six months, it would be a much easier and far more efficient way of figuring out exactly what's going on with palm mortality in this particular patch and we're talking about a stretch of area that's about a mile long and maybe a third a quarter to a third of a mile wide so it's not that big an area to survey with the drone we just need permission from san diego county to get going in here and start this project the area behind you that's burnt down um, now it's probably not the best time of day but as it gets evening there's a lot of homeless folks that sort of build encampments and that through here we've sort of colonized some of my study sites further down so i've got to figure out what i'm going to do about that i guess two years ago google earth took a map you know a shot of this area and you can see the guy's tent i think his name's dale i think that's what charles was telling me you can see dale's tent just over there and when i started this project you know four months ago dale was over there you know yelling at me going all crazy and stuff and he had still had his tent over there and it came back what six weeks ago and i think he'd set all this area on fire probably when his campfire or something got out of control and i think he's subsequently been taken away from this a area there's a lot there. of these encampments through here and if you walk the trail you see there's a lot of trash and stuff that people have just been throwing you know rubbish everywhere which is kind of a shame okay so i just wanted you you've seen the, the, the nibbled leaves you've seen the palm now with the crown that sort of died and collapsed and this this the palm at this stage is not salvageable now it's pretty much done mm -hmm. the one back at the golf course with the nibbled leaves might be savable and that was sort of evidenced by the healthy fronds that were still coming up through the middle which may or may not suggest that the golf course may have treated that palm after i pointed it out to them so you guys have any questions i'd be happy to answer them. this is our last stop so we're all free to take off once I, we're done here and you've got your photos and that i got yes. yep. you know so you mentioned that it just the way I see it, this is kind of a standalone palm. The other ones are kind of in clusters. In clusters. Yep. Could that, and then the other one was a standalone. Yep. Could that be, is that something you're seeing common? Right, so um, the question is, you know, does, does palm <coughs> density have an, an influence on the infestation <coughs> probabilities? I don't think it does, because studies out of the Middle East indicate that when palms are in clusters, 
and there's more humidity and the, the canopy is thicker and there's more shade, they're more likely to be attacked in hot desert environments like this. But I'm sort of, looks like I'm lying when I say <laughs> that. The evidence would speak contrary to that, but we've only seen two palms. I can take you to a cluster over near Andorra Way where there's about three or four palms that are tightly bunched. They have all gone down with, with palm weevil activity. So if you just want to drive along Bonita Road until you get to Andorra Way just before you get on the 805, there's a power line there <coughs> and you'll see the big palm like this right against the road that's died and there's at least two or three small palms like this one behind it which have collapsed also. But so. As a management project in Saudi Arabia now, they have gone to spacing their palms more widely to increase sun penetration and lower humidity levels. <coughs> and some of the evidence suggests that may lessen the likelihood of pa red palm weevil in, in, you know, infestations of date palms in these hot desert areas. Yeah. How did you find this, or have you always lived in the house? <laughs> uh, no, um, basically when I, when I showed you the map, of, you know, Tijuana, then seeing San Isidro, then the finds in, in the between here and San Isidro. Uh -huh. I got some CDFA data and I, Jason provided that. I was just driving around looking for palms and I saw this reserve and I was astonished that there were so many canaries in here. And then what we had learned, see this is the value of going overseas to do this work, you know, we had learned a lot about weevil attack, what types of palms they like, you know, the environmental conditions, especially the humidity and the free water and that sort of stuff. You know, the, the alarm bells were screaming when I saw this place. It's like, if there's going to be any perfect habitat for the weevil, it has to be this place. So Iskatech supplied us the pheromones, and you know we came out here, and I, I was hanging the traps, and the damn things were flying at me before I'd even hung the traps. They were, they were smelling the pheromones. I, I swatted one out of the air, and that was my first capture. So it's like, well, here they are. You know, I don't really need to do any more trapping, but we have 10 traps set through here. Nobody's screwed around with them over the last four months, which I'm hoping will continue. We hope to be able to answer some of those you know, seasonal questions. You know, does trapping activity fall off over the winter? And that may tell us that weevils don't fly as much over the winter. And you see in these palm trees and how thick they are and just how much protection the trunks have and the fermentation and the warmth within those trunks. It's high, I think it's highly unlikely that the weevils will shut down completely when they're inside those trunks creating their own microenvironment that's probably warmer than the ambient temp outside temperature. You, you had a question, yeah, Lauren? the whole time, uh, all, all around the farm, I always made like a uh, like weevil or extracoles. Where would you okay. usually see the extracoles? Right, so a lot of the activity would not be on the lower part of the trunk. You would see it up near the top. And the fronds that have dropped, I haven't looked at these ones, but if they have been tunneled by the weevil, you know that specimen I had on the table out in the back? You'd see those tunnels through there, and sometimes there'll be, you know, cocoons and that squeezed into those tunnels as well. Yeah, so those types of holes have been done by other things, probably, and not, not palm weevil. Yeah. Mark, I can see the tunnels with this. Oh, you can I'm see tunnels at the top? Yeah, take a look. <laughs> where, where am I? Look at the patio. Patio. This is the patio. Oh, yeah, I can see some. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so with the binoculars, you can see some of those two holes in the in the top petiole fronds. There's some over on this side that I can see with John's binoculars. So that would be the best place to look would be in the apex of the tree trunk, especially with the fronds that are still attached to the tree or if, or if a lot of them have fallen down. You might just want to start pulling those out to see if you can see the tunneling and the cocoons. You know, if you're on grass and it looks suspect and you see cocoons lying on the grass, as one guy told me, he said, Dan, that looks like weird dog shit and he was picking it up. But it was actually those weevil cocoons. So he'd seen them before, just didn't really know what they were at the time. Where did you find the weevil? Yes, yeah, so I collected 57 out of here last night, so I've got the traps. Uh, yeah, I've got traps from here right down to the other end of the reserve, so they're pretty much all through here. Yeah. Those 57 were one night, or how long? The traps have been out for three weeks. So if this was a, a, an infestation that we were trying to control because we were growing dates commercially in oil, oil palms, this would be a huge crisis for those managers. 
It's an unacceptably high number. If you're catching more than... My feeling is, based on what I've read, if you're catching more than one or two weevils per trap per month, you've crossed the economic damage threshold. So we're five to six times that here right now. You know, we see a lot of healthy palms, they may be infested right now. Right, so those are the issues. You're right. Yeah. So what's the hold up of getting clearance to fly your drones? What, what are they resisting? Right, so I, my understanding is they have no policy, San Diego County has, or Parks and Rec have no policy in place for flying drones in public areas. And I'm not sure if that applies to just casual fun use or for research purposes. So they're in the process now of deciding what sort of documentation needs to be drafted to let us fly legally. We've supplied everything they've asked for, and they came back last night to say well, we don't have the right paperwork in place at this kind of issue for missions. suspect that may not have been reported yet. We have a company yeah, yeah. Uh, we yeah. have a sorry with the back company. Right. Uh, we saw some manner similar to the one that we saw in front of the church. Okay. Uh, we were told that it could also be confused with uh, rat or kidney damage. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was told as well. It could be rat damage as well, yeah. Well, that's what we have. Okay, but you obviously you guys haven't seen anything like this so far. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So please keep your eyes open. We supplied the information on the website where you can fill out our survey if you see stuff that you think suspect and that we need to know about. And please upload photographs if you can. You know, photos of a palm that looked like this. Maybe you find a palm frond where the base of the rackets is like drilled out with holes, cocoons. Any type of evidence you think would help with the diagnosis. You know, we'd really like to start getting that. We just don't, you know, between the UC, UC Cooperative Extension, CDFA, USDA, we just don't have enough feet on the ground to be out looking for this stuff. So if you guys can help us out, we'd greatly appreciate it. Hey, isn't there yeah. some chemical kills that look like this? Like uh, her herbicide ways of killing that degrade to this status? Um, I don't know. Don? We, I saw Don. Where is he? Don, do herbicides kill palms like this? Okay. All right. I so feel like I've seen. I've seen. I feel like I've seen it, but it was in like areas where Mexican fan palms were killed, and they were killing these too. And right. like the center frond died off. And well, see that. If you see that with Mexican palm fronds, that's Don's power line trimming, and you see a lot of that where they come up and they've just taken the chainsaw and like what wall up the top. Right. Yeah, there's no power lines. Oh, there's no power no, lines. No, okay. Not in this scenario. It was like an right. open space area they were trying to eradicate non-natives. Yeah. They killed okay. all the Mexican fan palms, but they also killed these. And all right. To me, it looked like. You, Similar look to that. Right, well, a really easy way to do that without pesticides would be to chainsaw the top off them. Yeah. And then the thing Hello. would just die. Hello. Yeah, that's it, take it out. <laughs> All right, more you, questions? Have you contacted yeah. the Southern California Palm <laughs> Society to we'll let them know that this uh, has happened down here? Uh, yeah, here. Don's been Bravo. helping okay. get the word okay, out with the, with the palm industry. Yep. There's some eyes that yep. will be able to tell. And this well, guy right better better behind you, Cristobal, is in touch with the Mexican palm enthusiasts, and he's been helping us with all this as well. Those guys have an eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this Cristobal's really helped a lot with the Tijuana surveys. He's setting out traps in Rosarito and Ensenada now for us. So, you know, he was the guy that called me on the phone and said, "We've got to come down to Tijuana and have a look." And went down and we did a day's driving around, hit some good restaurants and stuff, and put that map together. So, what I want to do now is go back to Tijuana and find a health, a hundred healthy canaries and then go back every six months to see at what rate those are disappearing at now. Yeah. Good job. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Mark, there hasn't yeah. been any surveys in Mexicali yet. I, no, not that I'm aware of. No surveys in Mexicali. Alright, any more questions? If not, class is dismissed. Yeah. By the eight and where Briar starts to start. So what's the San Diego River is right there. Yeah. There's quite a few poems in there that are